Hi, this is Dr. Jesus Esquivel from San Agnes Hospital in Baltimore, Maryland. Good afternoon. I have been involved in the treatment of patients with peritoneal surface malignancies for 15 years and have uh, taken care of over 500 patients with appendix cancer, colon cancer, ovarian cancer, peritoneal mesothelioma, stomach cancer, and small bowel cancer with peritoneal dissemination. One of the main issues that we face on a daily basis is the selection of patients for the right therapy. Over the next uh, 15 minutes or so, I will give you a presentation on what I think is a common sense approach to the patients with colon cancer with peritoneal dissemination. <clears throat> During this time, we will review what is colon cancer with peritoneal dissemination, how often does it occur, are all the patients the same, and how should they be treated, is there a role for surgery with hyperthermic intraperitoneal chemotherapy, and do all patients need systemic chemotherapy? So we all are able to speak the same language. I'll go through some important definitions. Peritoneal dissemination is also called peritoneal carcinomatosis or peritoneal surface malignancy. It is a different route of a spread of a tumor. Most of the tumors can spread in a local fashion, meaning the tumor will grow and attach to a nearby organ they can spread through the lymph node system or through the blood. When we talk about carcinomatosis or peritoneal surface malignancies, this situation is going to happen usually as a result of a perforation in the primary tumor. If you can envision a balloon that you have poked a hole and let the air out, it will be very difficult to determine where did the air go. However, when we have a primary tumor that perforates, the cells will come out and exfoliate from the tumor and will distribute in the abdomen and pelvis in a very predictable fashion. This is not a random event. The preferred sites of dissemination or spread are going to be usually three sites. Number one, under the right chest, on top of the liver, because of the flow that we have of the peritoneal fluid, it happens in a clockwise fashion. Therefore, with every breathing cycle, this fluid will be pushed towards the undersurface of the right hemidiaphragm. The second mechanism will be involving the greater omentum. The greater omentum is an apron of fat that normally filters this fluid that we have in the abdomen. However, when free-floating cancer cells are encountered in the abdomen and pelvis, the omentum will entrap them, and once they're there, these cells will benefit from oxygen, blood, and other nutrients that would allow them to become a tumor deposit. The third mechanism will be the lower pelvis. Just by gravity, as we stand up, the fluid will go down to the pelvis. And in women, the ovaries will be frequently involved. This is as a result that most of the organs in the abdomen and pelvis will be covered by peritoneum except for the ovaries. Let's talk a little bit about the staging system. There are about 15,000 to 30,000 patients per year in the United States that have advanced colorectal cancer. The patients will be staged as a stage four disease. This is the highest stage you can receive. In 2012, the American Joint Committee on Cancer decided to separate these stage 4 patients into two groups. A stage 4A will include patients that have a spread confined to one organ, like the liver, the lung, or an ovary. And stage 4B patients will be those that have tumor that has a spread to more than one organ or the peritoneum. So, according to the AJC 
CC, the following three patients are the same stage, and that will be 4B. A patient with colon cancer with three small peritoneal implants. A patient with colon cancer with multiple liver and lung metastases. And a patient with colon cancer with involvement of the liver, the lung, and the peritoneum. So clearly, there is plenty of room for improvement when it comes to staging. The clinical implication of this staging system is that most medical oncologists will see any patient with peritoneal carcinomatosis as a stage 4B patient and will treat them the same way with palliative systemic chemotherapy. Usually it's going to involve a cytotoxic drug like Folfox or Folfiri and lately the addition of a biological agent the most frequently used would be bevacizumab. An unmet need, therefore, is to recognize that not all the carcinomatosis patients are the same. Recognize that there are patients in whom only the peritoneum is the only site of disease and therefore should not be grouped with patients with multiple organs involved. We also have to recognize that there are patients that can have few or a lot of metastasis in the peritoneum. And we have to recognize that the, this, the treatment of these patients could not be the same. Therefore, the challenge for us healthcare providers is to come up with a score that can evaluate the severity of the peritoneal dissemination. This score has to be, number one, easily reproducible, number two, should not require an operation to figure out the score, and most importantly, number three, it should have clinical relevance. We do know that the key players when we talk about patients with carcinomatosis, patients with a bowel obstruction, those that have lost a tremendous amount of weight, that have a significant amount of fluid in their abdomen that needs to be drained with a needle, and in addition have peritoneal carcinomatosis, is not a good situation. The famous PCI, the peritoneal cancer index, it has been validated as a prognostic indicator. However, it's a little too late because the patients require an operation and an exploration of their abdomen and pelvis in order to determine the PCI. We also know that the importance of the histology, meaning the type of tumor that is present, is very important. Therefore, we have come up with this peritoneal surface disease severity score, known as the PSDSS. It's a combination of the symptoms of the patient, the volume of the peritoneal carcinomatosis measured on a CT scan, and the pathology report of the tumor. With this in mind, we will talk about clinical symptoms. The patients can have none. They can have mild symptoms like abdominal pain, or they can have severe symptoms like a bowel obstruction. The measurement of the PCI, as I mentioned before, will be on a CAT scan, and will keep it to the volume of carcinomatosis as low, medium, or high. The pathology, this is well described across the nation. A grade 1 colon cancer will mean a well-differentiated tumor. Grade 2 will mean a moderately differentiated tumor. And a grade 3, a poorly differentiated or signet ring cell carcinoma. As you can see on this graph, we have put a three-tier of severity for these three parameters that we are evaluating. With that, each of these parameters are giving a number based on the degree of involvement. And as you can see on the lower left uh, part of this slide, we will have a summation of this score, and that will be translated into the stage or the peritoneal score for a particular patient. We have published the initial results in the Journal of Surgical Oncology uh, approximately three years ago. A follow-up publication included 56 patients 
that were follow-up on an average of 20 months, with an overall survival of 38 months. The standard quote for patients that have unresectable metastatic colorectal cancer treated with systemic chemotherapy only is approximately 24 months. When we submitted to a statistical analysis this peritoneal surface disease severity score, on multivariate analysis, only the score was significant, meaning that um, it is a very important predictor of how the patients are going to do based on this stratifying criteria. This graph just shows how the four different scores separate very nicely with a very significant uh, p-value, meaning that this is a, a statistical but also a clinically significant difference. So what is your peritoneal score? Patients with peritoneal score of one are usually going to be a patient that was taken to the operating room for a routine color resection I was found to have a few implants in the peritoneum. These implants were not detectable on a CT scan. Most of these patients will go and have the resection of the primary tumor and then will be referred to a medical oncologist for systemic chemotherapy. In my opinion, these are ideal patients to be evaluated by a cytoreductive surgeon before they start chemotherapy, as most of them should have cytoreduction and hyperthermic intraperitoneal chemotherapy first to remove those small peritoneal implants and then use the systemic chemotherapy to maintain that complete surgical response. What about a peritoneal score of 2? These are patients that their CT scan will show some evidence of carcinomatosis but was not detected before surgery frequently because uh, this will be indirect signs of carcinomatosis or because a lot of uh, radiologists are not familiar with these early signs of carcinomatosis on an imaging study. They may have a laparoscopic procedure that is converted then to an open procedure when the carcinomatosis is found, and sometimes the primary tumor will be removed, but sometimes there is too much carcinomatosis and some of these patients will go on and have only a biopsy or an ostomy to try to prevent a bile obstruction. I believe these patients should also be referred to a cytoreductive surgeon before they start chemotherapy. Some of these patients should have cytoreduction and HIPEC before chemotherapy, just like those patients with peritoneal score of 1. When we move to peritoneal score of 3, these are going to be patients that have a well-established volume of carcinomatosis or have a poorly differentiated tumor. A lot of the times, these will be patients that started as a peritoneal score of 2, but they were kept on chemotherapy and now their disease is progressing. Most of these patients need to be evaluated by a surgeon before or during their chemotherapy with the intention to see if once they're getting systemic chemotherapy, if they have a good response, they could become candidates for surgery. Finally, peritoneal surface disease severity score of four, this will be patients with extensive carcinomatosis, frequently from a poorly differentiated or signet ring cell carcinoma. Most of these patients will not be good candidates for cytoreduction and HIPEC, but should be evaluated after three months or so of systemic therapy with chemotherapy and biological agents to see if they have had a good response and perhaps they could have treatment under a clinical protocol. The reality is that most patients will not be referred to a cytoreductive surgeon. Most patients will continue on chemotherapy as is usually described until disease progression or intolerable side effects. Some of these patients will then find a cytoreductive surgeon and will ask to have a HIPEC procedure. The opportunity of having surgery will be lost by then in many of these patients. As an example, out of 109 patients referred to my program, 107 of them had failed systemic chemotherapy. So what should be done? 
I think that patients with colorectal cancer with peritoneal dissemination, they need to know their peritoneal score. Their healthcare providers need to know the peritoneal surface disease severity score. I think they should be evaluated by a center that performs cytotoxic reduction and HIPEC, and that these patients should consider a second opinion when their chemotherapy is changing to a second line because it's not working. If you have any questions, please contact Dr. Esquivel at esquivel at hypec.org. Thank you.